Hello, students. Um, in this video, we're going to go ahead and jump into Unit 4 for the first time, um, starting with the 4.1 notes. In these notes, we're going to look at um, how cells communicate and uh, maintain homeostasis. And so the majority of these notes, though, will be focused on cell communication and how cells communicate with their environment and communicate with other cells. So in this video, we're going to look at topic one. And so in topic one, we're going to look at what happens when a cell or how does a cell receive a signal? So starting with um, there's a signaling molecule of some sort, and then this is going to um, then have an effect on a specific cell. So how does that cell receive that that signal and then know what to do after that? And so before we get into that, I guess, let's go over just a, an overview of what cell communication is and why it's important. And so... Um, when, when we're talking about cell communication, we're talking about how cells can signal each other and um, how they can respond to signaling molecules that they find in their environment. Um, so this is super, super important and vital for, for cells and living organisms um, to be able to do this. Um, and single-celled organisms, so organisms that are just one cell, uh, cell signaling is really important for them to respond to what's going on in their environment, depending on different chemicals or molecules or um, that are present in their environment or different conditions in their environment, they have to be able to respond to that. Um, and then also sometimes single-celled organisms can communicate with other single-celled organisms um, through these, uh, these cell communication mechanisms that we're going to look at. And in multicellular organisms, um, so organisms that are made up of many, many cells like us and a lot of other eukaryotic organisms, um, cell communication is important for a couple of reasons. Um, one, again, to respond to the environment. So uh, sometimes in multicellular organisms, very often there's, there's things going on in the environment that this, the cells are going to respond to. But more important than that in multicellular organisms is that um, cells have to communicate to other cells that make up the organism because they're all working together to, to be one complete living organism. And so in our body, there's all these different types of cells that make up our body. And those cells have to be communicating to other cells in different parts of the body and different body tissues um, in order to coordinate everything that needs to happen and everything that's going on inside of the, the organism. Um, and then when we look at these, these signaling pathways, when we look at how these mechanisms involved in cell communication and these different things, specific things that are happening in cell communication, um, we often find that there's a lot of similarities um, in in a huge variety of life. So in our cells and in other organisms, types of cells and prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, we do see a lot of similar players and a lot of similar steps taking place overall when cells are communicating, um, which uh, suggests that these things evolved very early on when cells started evolving on this planet. Um, and so when we look at uh, this more specifically in topic one and a lot in topic two, um, we can break this down into to three steps. So we, we call these a, a signal transduction pathway. So a signal transduction pathway is how a cell can receive a signal from outside the cell and then ultimately turn that into some kind of response that's now gonna happen inside the cell. So now the cell needs to respond and do something because of that signal that it received from outside the cell. And the steps that take place for that to happen um, it's called the signal transduction pathway, which can be broken down into three stages. There's the recept reception stage, the transduction stage, and the response stage. So it starts by a cell first binding to a signaling molecule with a receptor protein. So there's some kind of receptor protein that's going to bind to a signaling molecule that came from outside the cell. And then there's going to be a series of steps and um, things that happen inside the cell. Specifically, these are um, going to be a bunch of different proteins inside the cell that become activated and activate other proteins. Um, and then eventually that will lead to some kind of response inside the cell. So then with all this stuff that happens, it's going to lead ultimately to the cell doing something now because of that signaling molecule. And so in topic one, we're going to mainly focus on this first part, reception. So how does a cell receive a signal? Um, so these, these signaling molecules um, that, I'm, that are affecting cells. We call them ligands. So a ligand is the, the term, the vocab term, for a signaling molecule that can, that can produce an, a response in another cell. And these signaling molecules are released from other cells. So there's, there are certain cells who are producing and releasing these, these ligands, these signaling molecules, and they're going to um, eventually find what we call target cells that have specific receptors that can bind to those ligands 
and then produce those signal transduction pathways that lead to the cell responding. Um, so we call those target cells. Target cells are the cells that have receptors that can specifically bind to those specific ligands released by a, a specific cell. And then there's non-target cells um, that don't have certain receptors for, for a, a specific ligand. And so we would call this guy a, a non-target cell because he doesn't have the receptor needed to re respond to this ligand. Um, and so when when a, so this this whole thing will begin, like I said, with the ligand binding to a receptor. And so these receptors are, are these are these are proteins, by the way. So these are specific proteins made of chains of amino acids that I have folded up into a specific shape, and they have a, a binding site for, for the ligand. So somewhere on this protein, there's a, a what call, what's called a ligand binding domain, where it's going to bind to that ligand. Um, now these ligands, um, these are different chemical molecules that can act there's a lot of different chemical molecules that can act as these these ligands these signaling molecules oftentimes they're they're peptides which are just short sequences of amino acids or they could be some other small random chemical or even larger proteins can act as ligands but they bind to these specific receptor proteins um, that have a binding spot for them and that's going to then um, a lot of times cause that receptor protein to then change shape somewhere else and so if you look at this picture here the ligand is binding to this protein and then over here on the other side it's changing shape and that change in shape is going to now cause something else to happen um, and so we call that if you guys remember like that, that's there was a term for that when we talked about enzymes. It's called allosteric regulation, which is when a when a there's a protein and that protein can bind to a specific. There's a molecule that can bind to that protein, and that molecule binding to that protein causes a, a change in shape somewhere else on the protein. A lot of times where the active site is. Um, so if this was like an enzyme, and a lot of times receptors do act as enzymes, um, they have a binding spot for the ligand, which is not the active site. And then somewhere else on the protein, like over here, th this would probably be the active site where now there's going to be a certain reaction that takes place um, now that this protein has has changed conformation, changed shape. And so throughout this whole cell, these, these signal transduction pathways that we're going to look at in these notes, um, you're going to see that happen a lot where things are binding to proteins and then those proteins change shape somewhere else, which is going to lead to something else happening. And so that's, that's a, a, a huge player here. When we're looking at how cells are communicating and how these signal transduction pathways are taking place um, and then it's also important to point out that these ligands binding to the receptor this is um this is non -co a non-covalent well so when i say binding don't think that it's a covalent bond that's forming like we've talked about a lot with proteins things bind to proteins but it's just temporary um it's just a a, a, a somewhat weak attraction holding them together and then eventually like the signaling molecule will go away um and so uh, to, to, to wrap up these notes, topic one, then we're going to look at two types of re two main types of receptors. So there's two categories of receptors that we see in cells. There's there's intracellular receptors and there's membrane receptors. Um, intracellular receptors, these are receptor proteins that are located inside the cell. So they're actually in the cytoplasm of the cell floating around. Um, they're not on the cell membrane they're, they're inside the cell. There's just these receptor proteins floating around. We call those um, intracellular receptors. And those are going to have ligands that are um, small and nonpolar, which can easily go through the phospholipid bilayer. So if I have a signaling molecule outside the cell and it needs to bind to a receptor inside the cell, it needs to be able to easily diffuse across the, the phospholipid bilayer, across the cell membrane. And if you guys remember in unit two, we talked about how um, nonpolar molecules are very good at doing that. They can squeeze through the phospholipids and just go through the um, in and out of cells. And so um, when we're looking at an intracellular receptor, the ligand is usually going to be a, a nonpolar molecule of some sort that's binding to it. Um, and then um, a lot of times, though, the receptors we're looking at are membrane receptors. These are way more common. These are receptor proteins that are actually embedded on the cell membrane, and they bind to signaling molecules outside the cell. So again, you have signaling molecules, these ligands outside the cell, and a lot of times they actually just bind to receptor proteins who are embedded on the cell membrane. And they can bind to that protein on the outside of the cell, and then that protein can then cause something to now happen inside the cell. And there's two types of uh, membrane receptor proteins that we're going to look at um, in this class, at least. There's a lot of different types, but these are two examples that you guys should know for this class, which we'll get to in a second. But let's start with intracellular receptors. So here's just um, a quick example of what that might look like. So here's a cell, 
And then inside the cell, there's this receptor protein. This is an intracellular receptor. It's located inside the cell and it can bind to a specific signaling molecule, a specific ligand. In this case, it's a hormone. Um, so for example, like a, um, in this case, it's testosterone. So this is a, a sex hormone, which is a, a lipid. This is a steroid. If you guys remember, it's been a while, but these are steroids, which are lipids, which are nonpolar which means that they can easily diffuse into the cell. So this guy can easily go into the cell and he can bind to his receptor protein. And then that receptor protein becomes activated and then causes other things to now happen in the cell. In this case, um, and actually this is a very common thing that happens, is these receptor proteins that become activated um, act as transcription factors. Um, transcription factors are proteins that can then go transcribe and turn on certain genes. So then when this receptor protein be binds to the ligand, it becomes activated, it goes into the nucleus and then turns on specific genes inside the DNA. And then that causes new proteins to be made. And then those new proteins can start doing something that needs to happen inside the cell. Um, so that's ultimately the response that's being produced here is that we're turning on new genes and causing new proteins to be made inside the cell. And those new proteins are now gonna go do a specific thing, whatever this hormone, whatever effect this hormone is having on the cell, that's eventually what's going to happen. Um, so the, the key point here is that for these intracellular receptors, their ligands are going to be nonpolar. They would never have a polar or large um, ligand because it would have to be able to easily go through the, the phospholipid bilayer. So steroids are good examples. Um, steroid hormones like your sex hormones, testosterone and estrogens, those are those are lipids that are, are nonpolar and, and do this in our cells. They're, they have intracellular receptors. Um, but like I said, the, the way more common ones are, are membrane receptors. These are receptor proteins embedded on the cell membrane and you have these ligand molecules outside the cell and they bind to the protein outside the cell, which then causes something to then happen inside the cell. And so one type that we're going to look at is, well, there's two types we're going to look at. The first we'll look at in this on this slide is our ligand-gated ion channels. So a ligand-gated ion channel is a type of membrane receptor. Um, and if you break down what this term is saying, it's saying that it's a, an ion channel, which means, if you guys remember, we talked about ion channels in unit two. These are transport proteins that let um, molecules go in and out of the cell. It's a channel protein. Um, specifically, these are ion channels, so they're, they're letting specific ions go in and out of the cell. So, um, for example, like sodium ions or chloride ions or hydrogen ions, different ions, specific ions can go in and out of these channels, um, but only when they're open. And so these guys, these are uh, a special, special uh, type of ion channel where they actually are closed and they only open when they bind to the signaling molecule. So here's the ligand, it binds to this ion channel. Um, that's closed and by binding to it it then allows the the protein to change shape and then that protein changes shape in a way that it's now open which can then allow ions certain ions whatever type of ion channel this is it depends but certain ions can now diffuse in or out of the cell and so that's going to change the concentration of of ions inside or outside the cell so now you're going to have a, a lowering of an ion concentration or, or an increase in ion concentration because of ions being able to diffuse in and out of the cell. So that's what these ligand gated ion channels. So ligand gated means like it's it's gated, meaning you can only open and close the gate with a, a ligand. It depends on these signaling molecules. So that's one type of membrane receptor. And then by changing that ion concentration, that then causes things to now happen inside the cell. So a good example of this is um, in your guys' muscle cells. In your muscle cells, you have um, these um, ligand gated ion channels called acetylcholine receptors. So these are membrane receptors that can bind to a signaling molecule called acetylcholine. And when acetylcholine binds to these, um, these, trans these ion channels, it causes them to open. These ion channels then open, and it allows sodium and calcium ions to diffuse into the cell, into your muscle cells. And that actually is what causes muscle contraction. And so when I want my bicep muscle to contract to pull my arm up, if I want to move my skeleton, I have to contract different muscles in my body. And so just an easy example is my bicep. If I want to move my arm upward, I have to contract my bicep. To do that, there's going to be um, a nerve impulse sent from my brain to my bicep that's going to cause acetylcholine ligands, these signaling molecules, to bind to my the acetylcholine receptors in my muscle cells. And then those receptors are going to open 
those ligand gated ion channels are going to open and let calcium and sodium ions go into my muscle cells. And when so calcium and sodium goes into my muscle cells, it causes my muscle to contract. It, it activates motor proteins that cause uh, the contraction of a muscle. And so that's a, that's a good example, kind of an easy example of, of ligand gated ion channels and how these um, re receptors, when they bind to their ligand, are going to cause a certain response inside the cell. In this, in this case, it's motor proteins becoming activated and contracting the muscle. Um, and then the last one we're going to look at are G protein linked receptors. These are another type of membrane receptors. So these are proteins, um, protein receptors embedded on the cell membrane, and they're called G protein linked receptors. Um, these are actually super common. These are probably one of the most common type of um, receptor proteins that we see in different examples that come up in class. Um, they're very common among eukaryotic organisms like our cells and other types of eukaryotes. Um, and so to kind of walk you through this, I won't read all of this, but I'll kind of walk you through this picture here that kind of shows you what's going to happen. And so here's a, uh, a G protein linked receptor, or in this case, they call it a G protein coupled receptor. But it's this guy right here. He's a membrane receptor. He's located on the cell membrane. And there's a ligand that can bind to him, a specific signaling molecule that binds to him. You guys can see that here. And when that ligand, that signaling molecule binds to this G protein linked receptor, it then causes this receptor to, to change shape and become activated, allowing it to bind to this thing called a G protein on the inside of the cell. So on the inside of the cell, there's these G proteins, which are floating, um, they're, they're peripheral membrane proteins floating on the inside of the cell membrane. So they're floating on the inside of the cell membrane here. They're called G proteins. And they have the, this molecule called GDP attached to them. Um, GTP, GDP is a low energy molecule, but that molecule can be replaced with a high energy molecule called GTP. And if you're, um, you might be thinking that this sounds a lot like ADP and ATP, and it, it is a lot, it is just like ADP and ATP. So this is another type, it's basically ATP's twin. Um, it's another type of, of high energy molecule that cells use. Um, just not as common as ATP. But anyway, this guy, this G protein, when he's inactive, he has this GDP molecule attached to him. Um, now what's going to happen here is when this G protein linked receptor binds to the signaling molecule, it's going to allow this receptor to then bind to the G protein. And when it binds to the G protein, it, it causes a GTP to bind to the G protein and kick off the GDP. So then the GDP gets kicked off and a GTP can bind to the G protein. And when the GTP binds to the G protein, the G protein becomes active. So the G protein is only active when a GTP molecule binds to it. And that's only going to happen when the G protein linked receptor binds to the signaling molecule. So that's what's happening here. Signaling molecule, G protein linked receptor binds to the G protein, allows it to be activated by GTP. And then that activated G protein is they going to mosey on over. It's going to float across the cell membrane inside the cell, and it's going to go bind to another cell, another protein on the cell membrane. So in this case, there's this enzyme here who's located on the cell membrane, and he's in his inactive shape. But when the G protein becomes activated, it can then go bind to this guy and activate this enzyme protein. And then that enzyme protein, when it becomes activated, is now going to start catalyzing a certain reaction, and that's going to lead to a bunch of other things taking place inside the cell, which is ultimately going to lead to the cell responding some way. And then once that guy is done binding to and activating this enzyme, you can see that it goes back, everything goes back to normal. So then this guy goes back, the GDP gets broken back into GDP. And you can see that that third phosphate gets knocked off just like ATP. And so now we have back uh, an inactive G protein, the G protein linked receptor, the ligand's gone. And then this guy who's just asleep right now, this enzyme, um, but in order for all this to happen, again, it all started with the signaling molecule. The signaling molecule binded to this receptor protein, activated it, caused this G protein to become activated, and that activated G protein caused this other protein to then be activated. So you have a sequence of proteins becoming activated one after the other after the other, and this will actually then continue on. Um, we'll look at, in topic two of the notes, we'll talk about how this will lead to even more proteins becoming activated inside the cell. Um, but uh, a lot of times this is how cells, this is what happens when cells first receive a signaling molecule. Some of them bind to these G protein link receptors. Um, and so the very last slide here kind of just talks about how, um, in, like I said, in eukaryotes, G proteins are very common in eukaryotes. 
Um, and they're all very similar. So in R cells and in plant cells and in yeast cells and protist um, and across a huge variety of eukaryotes, we see these G protein and these G protein linked receptors and they're all very highly conserved, meaning like the, the, the structure of them is very similar. And so in, in all cases we have um, these G protein linked receptors have what's called seven transmembrane regions. So this whole protein here, there's seven regions of this protein that go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth through the membrane. Um, and we see that exact same situation every time we see a G protein linked receptor in every type of cell um, that has these on this planet. And then there's these G proteins. This is the G protein. It looks more complicated in this picture, but the G protein actually has three subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. And we see those, those three subunits very similar every time we see a G protein in every type of cell that we, we, we find these G proteins in on this planet. Um, so it's just evidence for the fact that um, this probably evolved very early in life on Earth, and um, it, it's, it's evidence for evolution and how it's been kept and used in all the different type of eukaryotic organisms that exist today. Um, but again, this part is probably not that important. It doesn't come up too much. We'll talk more about evolution a lot at the end of the school year. Um, but that's basically it for topic one. Hopefully these receptors kind of make sense and these membrane receptors versus these intracellular receptors and how they have to bind to their ligand and become activated. Um, and then in topic two, like I said, in the next video, we'll look at, okay, now that there is a signaling molecule binding to a receptor, um, that's often going to lead to another long series of steps called a, a transduction pathway. And that's what we're going to talk about in in topic two and how that ultimately produces a cell response um, once we have all this stuff going on inside of the cell. So anyway, thank you guys. I'll see you later.